So just a quick thing. Yeah, this is the first slide. So uh, I noticed that uh, the, pro, um, the title of my talk uh, has changed in the, pro in the program. So originally one uh, thing was accepted for the talk. Um, but then uh, the other thing that I submitted for the poster appeared in the, pro in the, in the program. So now I have two talks and yeah. So I have two talks, and the one you you. Okay, so the one you like the most, uh, are we going to uh, to tell about? So as you wish. So either talking about dissipation time uncertainty relation or normal Markovian Brownian dynamics and non-equilibrium bath. So let's vote first for the dissipation time. Okay. Yes. Let's vote for. Oh, I think, I think you have to do both. The one. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it was slightly more for the second one. Yeah. Okay. So, and indeed, I guess the right thing because you see, the first is the one that you wanted. Amazing. Okay. Uh, yeah. Then. Okay. Then it's my pleasure to announce Jean Maria Falasco, who is going to talk about non Markovian Brownian dynamics in non-equilibrium paths. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, so, uh, so this is a uh, this is some joint work that has been going on uh, for a few years with uh, Marco Bayesi and Klaus Kroy when I was back in, in Leipzig and other collaborators. So this is a story that uh, so I'm going to touch on things that we heard today already. So for example, long time tails, uh, and I want to start from uh, essentially uh, the uh, uh, from normal Brownian motion. Uh, the one that we are used to, to talk about actually is using, using sim simple Langevin equations. But actually, if you, if you talk to experimentalists and they have enough time resolutions, well, uh, even simple Brownian motion in a one component fluid has to be described uh, with a generalized Langevin equations. And this is, as we heard before from the talk by Thomas, is because of momentum conservation in the fluid. Whenever you move a particle in the fluid, you are displacing a huge amount of uh, uh, of fluid around, and it takes some time to rearrange the, uh, the fluid around, so that we will, you will always have some long memory, uh, long memory, of course, on time scales that for a micron particle is of order of uh, uh, milli, uh, milliseconds. Uh, so we'll have this kind of uh, so friction coefficient that is now time dependent with the, uh, with, uh, with, the, um, with the exponential tails. And if you are in a bath which, has, uh, which is at equilibrium, so the temperature is fixed and is T, so we know that the uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem must hold such that the uh, correlation of this Gaussian uh, noise uh, is given by the same, uh, the same symmetrized function that appears here. Um, so uh, this is essentially, this is from uh, experiments. This is what you observed, and this is what would be predicted by a simple Langevin equation with, without memory. Um, so all uh, these ingredients, uh, they uh, still, because of fluctuation dissipation relation, you end up with equilibrium distributions, and you end up with uh, essentially fluctuation dissipation on the level of the observables. So uh, mobility of a particle dragged in this fluid and uh, the natural the fluctuations in the mean square displacement will be proportional to each other. So now, but my point here is what happens if we, if we put the environment out of equilibrium? And one simple way to do that is essentially to uh, induce a thermal gradient in the fluid around the particle. And this is actually something that happens very, very uh, often in experiments whenever you have a particle and you do some uh, tracking or tracing with laser light such that part of the laser light is absorbed by the particle itself, the particle radiates around, and so it creates a temperature gradient that moves with the particle. And so now we want to see what happens to this Langevin equation, generalized Langevin equations, if we can still write it down, and what, what are the properties of this. Uh, the point is that we, um, we cannot directly write it down because the environment is out of equilibrium. So what we can do is to step back, go to uh, underlying uh, this, uh, this level of description. And this description is the one, for example, including the degrees of freedom of the bath in terms, for example, of uh, hydrodynamic quantities. So temperature, uh, velocity, local velocity of the fluid, and mass, uh, mass density. 
So in general, since this particle move, moves uh, slowly with respect to the heat diffusion, essentially the temperature gradient, you can show, moves statically with the particle. So that this is already, uh, you, can, you can find this temperature gradient, the mean temperature gradient around the particle in this way. Then what you can do is to consider fluctuating hydrodynamics. So on the hydrodynamic, on the Stokes equation, Stokes because the, uh, mm, the, uh, we are at low Reynolds number, on the Stokes equation you can mount uh, Gaussian fluctuations. Uh, Gaussian fluctuations with the assumption that locally these are equilibrium fluctuations. So at each and any point you have this fluctuation dissipation relation with the local temperature. So the fluid is in local equilibrium. We want to see what happens to this particle that now samples and probes uh, this, uh, this fluid. So what you can do essentially is to, you can coarse grain these things. You can get rid uh, of, the, um, uh, of the hydrodynamic fields. And so you can go again, you can find out that still there is a Langevin equation holding. Sorry, you need to go yes. eta of t. Eta of t, yes. This is a, this is a property, of, it's a material property. So you need to know that your fluid is water and I need to put a guess here. Usually, yeah, you parameterize this thing with a vogel fulke uh, function there. Uh, but in general, the dependence here, it's not so, so, so important, okay? And for the theoretical results that I showed you uh, after, to get analytical results, we actually assume a constant eta, and you, you see that they will uh, fit nicely with the numerics. So the main modification here is that the still, you still have a Langevin equation. The difference is that you have a different, uh, a different noise uh, autocorrelation function that in frequency space you can rationalize in terms, if you want, of an effective frequency dependent temperature, which you can calculate analytically and it has a very specific physical meaning that you can explain very well. So this temperature is a local, essentially is an average of the temperature and the fluid around the particle sampled with the amount of energy that you locally dissipate in the fluid when the particle moves at frequency omega. So this function phi here is really, the function is the energy dissipating the fluid at a given point r when the particle oscillates at frequency omega. So the one is the same um, quantity that comes out of linear irreversible thermodynamics, essentially. So what's the meaning of that? This means that essentially these quantities, so the, 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 the thermal fluctuations uh, felt by the particles, they change with the frequency. So they change with the time scale of our observation. And this is because there's a dynamical coupling between uh, far um, points in the fluid and the particle itself. And this is mediated by essential, the shear modes of, the, of, of our, uh, our fluid. So essentially, if you imagine that your particle is oscillating at high frequency, so we look at the high frequency part of the spectrum, you have back and forth oscillations. The spreading of the hydrodynamics mode is then confined because they annihilate because of the short oscillations. And so this sample is, this average is only around the particle where the fluid is very hot. So at high frequency, the temperature is hot. Then if you go to low frequencies, essentially this average goes to larger volume that are farther apart and so they are cooler. So this temperature will go, uh, will go down. And that's essentially what you can calculate analytically assuming an effect uh, of uh, viscosity that is constant. And here I showed you uh, two curves because what I calculated is for two different motions. It's for translation, but also you can do that for rotation, Brownian rotation of the particle. And since you displace fluid in a different way, so the shear modes are different, you have two different curves. So you can already imagine that different degrees of freedom will feel different kind of uh, effective temperatures. Um, how actually would you calculate, how do you sample this temperature? Because this is a property of the noise. We rationalize the noise correlation in this way, but how do I measure this? Well, one, well, one way to measure that is essentially, um, is for example to uh, take this particle, confine it in a harmonic potential, and make this potential very strong. So uh, what I, the, the mean square displacement now of the particle would be like a filter, we will filter the, this uh, effective temperature with the response function of the position, but if the confinement is strong enough, the only frequency that we will see will be the frequency, the, effective, the, the uh, external frequency of our oscillator. And that, that's what we did in uh, MD, uh, if, uh, simulations where we were trapping this hot particle, confining it, then changes, changing the confinement, and so we were sampling uh, these uh, effective uh, frequency dependent temperature at various frequencies. And so you see the blue curve, which is what you want to observe, 
and what you want to sample, and the red dots that are the mean square displacement at different, uh, for different frequencies. The other point that I want to mention is that you have, if you now look at the dynamics, you take this particle, you drag the particle, you measure the response, the linear response, so you get this mobility, so with the, when this force is very small, uh, and you measure the uh, spontaneous fluctuations, uh, integral velocity, velocity fluctuation functions, now they are no longer proportional to each other, and actually, if you plot them in a parametric plot as a function of time, you, you will see that the slope of this line is changing and is interpolating between two, two different uh, values. One is the late time, uh, the, the zero frequency of that function that I showed you at the beginning, and the early time um, temperature is the one related to kinetic, um, to the kinetic energy. So it's the one associated to velocity fluctuations, which is something that is reminiscent of what happens in glasses. Um, but here everything can be analytically calculated and in a way uh, keep, kept under control. So let me just finish because here I just showed you an example of one way to drive a, the environment out of equilibrium where everything is under control. But one thing that is nice here is that the environment, because of the low Reynolds number, because the, the system is, is water, uh, is a very simple system, everything is essentially linear. And so I get a linear Langevin equation. But in general, if my environment, if I have strong interactions, I will have no linearities. So one way to deal with that, and this is what we did here, was actually to now couple my system with the environment. The environment now is no linear, is, is out of equilibrium because there are active particles, because it's a steel fluid or something like that. And because still there's a scale separation, so the system is very large, is, so these big particles, they are large, uh, they are much slower than the environment. Essentially, I can describe this coupling via response theory. So motion of the blue particles are just small perturbation on the background, on the environment that is out of equilibrium. And so using linear response, non-equilibrium linear response, you can essentially derive equations for Langevin equation, generalized Langevin equation, for these big pro particles in the non-equilibrium environment. And I just want to flash some, uh, some properties before concluding. So the average force on uh, each, felt by each of these blue particles is, because of the linear response structure, is the uh, average response without, with, with a steel environment. And then there is, there are, uh, there, there's a term due to friction, and this counts also uh, interactions between the probes, the big blue probes, mediated by the non-equilibrium environment and statistical forces that are, they, they, they are there and they do not depend on, on the velocity. So the first thing we are used to, to, to see it and in equilibrium is just the gradient of the free energy of the, of the environment. When we are out of equilibrium, this is no longer true, it's no longer a gradient force. And since, because of this thing, uh, these statistical forces are no reciprocal. So the force that one probe exerts on the other, it's different from the, the reverse, can be different from the reverse. And similar happen, a similar thing happens for the, for the friction. So this memory kernel is no longer given by the green Kubo, but there are modifications in this correlation function due to the probability currents induced by the driving. And so we, we will break this, this reciprocal kind of interactions. Um, yeah, so, uh, well, if you want to ask me a question about a specific example. <laughs> and no, with this I, I see that I'm going over time, so. So it's just a simple example where we were using this kind of linear response theory. So we were considering a one-dimensional system, soft sphere as an environment that is driven by a constant force, and there are big, two big probes that are confined. This is kind of two-point microreology, but in an active, kind of active driven uh, environment. And what we were measuring here was several things. One in particular is this memory kernel uh, that uh, encodes the information about the force that one probe exerts on another probe when it moves with a certain velocity. And because, in general, this thing is asymmetric, as I, I told you before, and this is because we, we essentially we break this symmetry imposing this, this force F, and the more we drive the system, the more we change the equilibrium properties, and we, we, the more we make these two functions different, even, even to a point where the entire, uh, the, uh, entire integral of this function can change sign so this means that we have essentially a negative response. We move one particle in one direction and the other is going not in the same direction, but in the other. And this is just a screening effect because we, we, we bring one probe closer to the other and we screen so the second from the original flow created by the external force. 
That's an example of what we can do and we can see with, the, with this theory. So with this, I conclude, and thanks a lot for, for the attention. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this super interesting talk, and you already all also lead it over to the next talk, which was super nice at the end. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, questions from the audience. Yeah. Hi, oh, so first of all, thank you for the talk. Um, my question is a bit, uh, weird, probably. Uh, so, yeah. if if the if the answer is really trivial, just like uh, tell me and like forget about my question. So, like it's related to the fact that you mentioned um, the effective temperature felt by different degrees of freedom might be different. So, for example, like a translational degree of freedom might feel that an effective temperature is different from a yeah. rotational one. So, my question is. If, if I engineered a system in such a way like to, do, to have like both a rotational and translational degree of freedom, because maybe this particle has an internal structure or more, yeah. like, can this be exploited like, in the, from the point of view of like, having a separation of like, two different thermalizations for separate degrees of freedom? Like the rotational degree of freedom will thermalize, I don't know, like in, to contact with a the thermal bath to a different temperature than the translational one? And it, uh, even without engineering anything okay. here, they will do that. Uh, unless you have specific cases, for example, in the case I showed you before, where you have a very strong confinement, in, in, in that case, you will select only one frequency, and that is the same for the, for, 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 for the two. But in, in general, they will be different without any engineering for okay, whatever will, parameter. Okay, I values. see. But it, can this create, like, so is this a temperature difference that can be exploited, like this, can this be created, create, can this be created a heat engine? In, in, in this case, uh, uh, in this case, what you, you can, so, so in, what you can see is that there are correlation between position and velocity. Okay. So this will not be there. Ah, okay. Even. So they're not independent. But, but okay. what I'm, I'm not saying that this temperature, they have a thermodynamic meaning in the sense that it's not that looking at them, uh, you can, you can infer in general what kind of fluxes of, heat you will have. I see. Okay. Perfect. Thank but, you very much. Yeah, there are people in the audience that know much more than me about that. Uh, there's thing. a question in the chat. Maybe yeah. you can just read it yourself. Do you take specific functional forms for the coupling uh, to derive the probe equation? So no, the, the coupling, so it's referring, this equation, this uh, question is referring to, uh, to these. So in this general theory, no, this is completely, it's just general. I have like Newtonian equations for the big particles. I have, in this case, over down Langevin motion for the small particles with some driving. And the forces, these are the forces on the big probes I, these are general. It's just that they have to come from a potential such that, such that the force on a probe is minus the force on the environment. Uh, but in general, they, they, are, they, are not, they are not specified in, the, in, the, uh, in this theory. In the specific problem here, these are like soft spheres so they can penetrate each other because we are in one dimension, otherwise we we have problems. Yeah. Uh, there's another also. Yeah, yeah, go, go do you need to take a large number of QS red particles to derive the probe equations? Or one can derive it for finite. You can derive it for finite. Uh, wait for the red particles. Yes. The, uh, this is a, there's an assumption uh, that there's a, there's a scale separation in terms of time between the, the uh, uh, between the dynamics of the small red particles and the blue uh, particles. Uh, for the number, no, there's no assumption uh, that has been made in, in this theory about the number of degrees of freedom in this environment for the theory to hold. Yeah, yeah. I hope this, uh, answer, this answers the question. Okay. A question from Edgar. A quick question about the simulations. So you, you're doing water and we, which in, um, which in the first day, the again, molecular dynamics. This yeah, so which and some are using MBT, MVE, or do, do you remember? Uh, so, uh, so this simulation is um, uh, MBT. Mm. Uh, we were using like, this is Leonard Jones interactions for the fluid. This is Leonard Jones plus a Fene interaction. So this is it's confining for the, uh, for, the, for the particles combining the colloid. Uh, yeah. And there was a re velocity rescaling algorithm to keep the, the, to keep the velocity uh, of the colloid uh, heating up. Uh, there are very few molecules in the bath, so 
Uh, do, do you take here? Uh, this is this just a snapshot. It, it's bigger. It, it's way, it's way, way, way bigger. So yes. Langevin is a good approximation. You check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things we work checking. in a yeah, in yeah. a time scale, and okay. Yes, I see. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think in the interest of time, we should move on to yeah. the last speaker of the session. Uh, and thank again, uh, Gianmaria, for this very interesting talk. Thank you.